hello everyone hello everyone yes i can see that we are recording i hope that the participants can hear me now okay yes i can see oh zara margani it's our first <laughs> it's our first edition participants hello hello it's nice to see you so i can see the reactions so you can see us so welcome everyone i must say good morning good afternoon good evening because we are in different time zones and also as we discussed before we are from different climates <laughs> which is also nice and i'm very happy to see all of you welcome all the experts as you can see we have very very nice group of people who devoted their lives to the topic of exercise during pregnancy and postpartum so uh, I would like to mention that we will have a few parts. So first we will start with Lene Hagstad from Norway. Then we will have Mirelle van Poppel from Austria, Sarah Moss from South Africa, Naimech Shoyaoyen from Iran, and Xian Guo from China. Also with us is Aneta Vorska. She is my um, person who supports me with everything so Aneta is also with us uh, and the webinar is I think quite interesting because as you can see we have experts from different parts of the world and I hope we will have chance to discuss the problems from different parts of the world so welcome all the participants I, I thank you very much for being with us today uh, we've already checked what country you are from, but maybe you would like to share the information with us, what country you are from. <laughs> we've seen a lot of countries. Uh, of course, we've seen Poland. I would be offended if no Polish people um, is with us. So we have a lot of people from Poland. But we've also seen uh, people from Croatia, from Lebanon, yes, from Germany, I can see. We have United Emirates and we also have South African people, Belgium, Sweden, perfect. So uh, yes, Ethiopia. Oh, Samuel Tefari, you are also our <laughs> NEFE participant. So that's also very nice that I can see the same faces because that means that you are benefiting from, from, from the project. So welcome everyone. We will start the presentations. So I will switch to the presentation now. And before we start, I would like to thank Szkoła Rodzenia Supermama, which is the birth school. And this is the uh, institution that supports the organization of the webinar. And of course, I would like to thank my university um, for the organizational and financial support. And we have the schedule. So as I mentioned, we will have five presentations from different uh, panelists then i will have 10 minutes for myself and for you to explain you what are the requirements to apply for the nepa training because we have a special i think very nice offer for you uh free training with the best experts from um, uh, all over the world so i will explain you how to apply and then we will have question time so uh, questions and answers are planned for the end of the webinar, we will have around 10 minutes. So if you are listening to the presenter, you can ask the question using the chat. Please write the name of the presenter first because later we will read the questions and it will be much easier for us to post the question to a proper person. Okay, so as previously <laughs> announced, the first expert is Professor Lene Hagstad from the Norwegian School of Sports Science in Norway, of course. I have some notes for each expert because there is the never-ending list of, of their achievements. But uh, uh, apart from being an exercise researcher, uh, she is also an academic chair, program manager for instructor and personal training education. So I think it's a very good, very good combination because Lene can combine research and also the uh, vocational training and education for exercise professionals. I think it's very useful for you. Uh, of course, Lene 
is focused on with the topic uh, on the topic of physical activity during pregnancy and she has over 80 um, publications with very good journals international journals and she was awarded many times but i think it's interesting for us that she uh, was a member of the consensus panel uh, from international olympic committee and it was a work on exercise during pregnancy and postpartum for recreational and elite athletes and she also worked on the scandinavian guidelines for physical activity and exercise during pregnancy in 2017 and 2020 and another important another important information about lena which i think it's uh, crucial for this topic today is that for a year i guess lena spent uh, in australia she was the visiting fellow at university of Quis uh, queensland in australia she was invited by professor wendy brown so we have also the australian perspective i hope that uh, lena will share uh, this experience with us today so lena the floor is yours please start your presentation Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. You can hear me, that's good, okay. So thank you, Anna, for your introduction and good afternoon from Oslo, Norway. And I will start this session by thanking Anna for putting this together. So my title reads, we have the guidelines, but what next? So I am introducing the topic with a big question because even though the evidence is clear, and we have a universal recommendation. Uh, I don't know what is happening here. Okay, let me see. So now I can see my slides again. Yes. So we have a universal recommendation that healthy pregnant women should be active and exercise for a minimum of 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity, giving several benefits and no increased risk of newborn complications or negative effects on birth weight. Studies have shown that the occurrence of recommended activity is lower among pregnant than non-pregnant women, and further that the levels tend to decline throughout the course of pregnancy. And I think all of us can agree that the existence of guidelines in isolation is unlikely to lead to increases in levels of physical activity. It is therefore important to do behavioral intervention research, including how can we encourage women to follow the guidelines? Because it is a big difference between knowing it and doing it. I have been responsible for four large RCTs since 2005, of which three is done among pregnant women. And in the Norwegian Fit for Delivery intervention, we did also explore individual experiences with participating in maternal group exercise. I will therefore, in this talk, draw on that project, the Fit for Delivery, as well as my own experiences, both as a researcher and exercise instructor, when discussing facilitators and barriers for exercise, including a particular focus on the pros and cons of group exercise sessions. Okay, so Lene, I will interrupt you for a moment. <laughs> uh, first, uh, I, I think that we are starting the most uh, interesting part uh, in relation to the benefits and also the weaknesses of some kind of exercises. So we are waiting for that. So I will pay attention of our attendees to, to be focused on that. And second, I would like you to ask you to switch on your camera if you can. <laughs> Could you please uh, switch on your camera because we cannot see you, only your presentation. Lena, are you with us? <laughs> I'm here. Okay. Oh, perfect. Yes. Yes. So now we can hear, we can also see you. So you can go ahead. I'm looking forward the pros of group exercise because it is also my field of expertise. I love group sessions very much. Go ahead. Okay. So I will start by addressing four, uh, three major advantages of group exercise session. Motivation and support. 
working out with others and the team atmosphere can help people become more accountable and increase their motivation. In my experience, the instructor is a key factor. Just knowing names and a little bit about who the participants are may be enough to make sure they attend the sessions regularly. The second point is also a big pro, because to the best of my knowledge, it is often not motivation or even time that keep pregnant women out of regular exercise. It is structure and lack of knowledge regarding what to do and how to exercise safely. So despite what we have said the last 20 years, pregnant women are still afraid exercise is going to hurt their baby. We therefore need training classes designed for maternal exercise, taking this stress off the women. The third and final bullet point on the green side, fun, variety and efficiency. In a good class, the exercises will be enjoyable, helping time fly by. Generally, group exercise sessions also have a dual benefit of cardio and strength training in one workout and exercises for the pelvic floor muscles must, of course, be included. Okay, so Lena, one question from me. Could you tell us more about the uh, maternal exercise, why they should be directed to them, not, you know, for other people? So what that means? What that means? Can you repeat your question, Anna? Yes, yes. Why we need group training classes designed for maternal exercise? Why it is important, maternal exercise? Because we have, you know, exercise professionals. They are yoga instructors, personal trainers. So why they need, you know, special education to know how to design exercise for moms, for future moms? Yes, I will come to that now. So you will okay. see this on the next slides. <laughs> okay, perfect. Yes, yes. So I will address the cons of group exercise too. And then I will address uh, the question from Anna, I believe in my presentation. So I will start with uh, the first item on my list. And this is a little bit complex because class size and the group dynamic is also an advantage of exercising together. Still, depending on where the classes take place, there can be an upwards of 30 people per session. And with only one instructor, this means the participants will not receive much individual attention. And in our paper, uh, we reported that pregnant women preferred classes from 10 to 20 individuals. And then is this point, one size fits all, because group exercise means everyone does the same workout. So it's therefore important that the instructor can offer modifications depending on the participant's fitness level and further do adjustments regarding trimester and be mindful of any pain. So this kind of answer your question, Anna, but I think um, this is simply not possible if you have a large group setting. And my uh, last bullet point is about the instructor's qualifications. And this will answer your question because all, as you all know, when a woman becomes pregnant, lots of things are happening to her body and coaching a pregnant woman comes with a lot of responsibility. And so it is important that the instructors are competent. They don't necessarily need a bachelor or master degree, but they should have some education in sports science and be certified to teach prenatal exercise classes. So you have now heard some pros and cons I have come to find with group exercises based on my work. And for those really paying attention, you will have recognized that I deliberately showed one hand pointing down, whereas six hands gave thumbs up. And I am in general very enthusiastic about working out together. But please do keep in mind that group exercise does not have to be in gym or directly supervised by a fitness instructor. Pregnant friends can get together, form a group at a convenient time to all, and do basic exercises in the park or at the house following a prenatal online exercise program of high quality. Another great option is power walking in small groups, providing moderate aerobic training with minimal stress on the joints. I will also watch for indoor group walks, and I repeat indoor group walks, for in Norway, for example, where I live, 
we have a rough climate with winter and icy roads about three, four months of the year. In other parts of the world, it is too hot and too humid to exercise outdoor at certain times. A gym has a good temperature for working out and the treadmill has a predictable surface. Also, the workout, the speed and incline can be controlled by the user. So the pregnant woman can adjust workout intensity according to her fitness level and the friend walking or running beside her, pregnant or not, can choose their workout intensity. And data from my country suggests that about 70% of adults have access to a fitness club within the distance of three kilometers. And as you can see in this table, Norway has together with Sweden, the largest population of fitness club members with more than 12,000 clubs spread around the country, almost comparable to grocery stores if I count the three biggest chains. And as Anna mentioned in the introduction, I have lived in Australia and giving this as another example in australia there are actually more fitness clubs than grocery stores if i sum up the dominating ones and this is very important because exercise must be convenient and accessibility is a key factor as lack of exercise locations appears to be an important barrier among pregnant women in rural settings whether this is australia or Norway. Also a downside of gym is they aren't free. A gym membership can cost anywhere from 10 to well over $150 per month with an average cost of about $40 per month or around 500 per year. So is it worth the cost? Well, I think a gym membership is a great option and worth it if you plan to use it. Also, most gyms offer a diversity of exercise options, so you can try, test out, and find an activity that you like. And it has certainly helped me exercise for many years regularly, mainly because I think group exercise is fun. It puts a smile on my face like these women. But also for this reason, the Norwegian weather and elements and least, but last but not least, that I like an instructor to train me. When that is said, I will once more in this talk also promote shorter or longer walks with friends, colleagues, family, or even a dog, bring free of charge and a universal uh, activity that nearly everyone can do anywhere. Also in a shopping mall. That works well in the heat in Australia, and it works well when it's snow and ice on the roads. Besides, a shopping mall is a safe venue for women when it's dark outside. Also, it is easier to stay committed when we have made appointments, since obviously we will not let our friends down. Okay, Lena, I will interrupt you again for a moment. Thank, so thank you for these two slides. So this is something that our participants must to remember because very often this is an excuse not to be active, uh, not only during pregnancy, but generally that it is uh, too expensive, that there is no sport facilities around. And yes, the walking, different versions, even uh, walking the dog, as you mentioned, I think that it must be uh, remembered that this is an option, even if you have a client. So, um, you know, just meeting with the client or uh, giving the advice, go for a walk. So it is much less expensive for, for, for the people that you are exercise with, right? I agree. Yeah. I totally agree. <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> okay. Thanks, Anna. So I will sum up and then I will briefly state the main points again. So I believe that targeted interventions to overcome barriers and facilitate exercise during pregnancy should focus on two areas. One, provide affordable and convenient locations to exercise and to enhance social support networks with supervised group exercise programs. I have, however, also added a third point. Because studies generally show 
or generally report that pregnant women often receive no physical activity advice or they receive advice when they are pregnant that is limited, conservative, incorrect, or lacking in specificity. So I think that we need to educate GPs and midwives in effective communication about safe exercise during pregnancy, and that this is very much needed. My final message or take home message of today is a kind of a cliche answer I guess you have heard before. But it is true. The single best exercise is the one you will do. This is the same for everything. It only works if you do it. The reason is consistency and adherence is the basic ingredient. A pregnant woman will not be stronger or healthier because of one workout. She will be stronger and healthier because of many, many workouts done on a regular basis. And I don't think I need scientific references for the notion that we are all more likely to do activities that we enjoy doing. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Lene. It is a very nice link to the presentation, I think, by uh, Sarah Moss later on about the <laughs> healthcare professionals and, and the numbers. So thank you for the summarizing and the, the importance of, of you know, education for health professionals as well. Uh, maybe we have some people from the health sector because I'm talking to you as to exercise professionals but maybe there are some uh, obstetricians or midwives if yes so please let us know <laughs> it would be great to have also you with us and also I could see uh, in the chat that you have some problems technical problems with the voice or with the sound I don't know I cannot support you with that we checked everything so um everything was clear for us and and uh, i don't know oh hello rita santos my friend <laughs> so hello rita from my heart to you i'm happy that okay now for the technical issues i hope that for other people it will be uh, okay as well so now i would like to introduce our next panelist uh, it will be uh, mireille van poppel from austria as i mentioned before uh, so uh, mireille is from university of graz but also interesting information is that before she moved to graz she has been working for 15 years uh, at the Department of Public and Occupational Health at the VU University Medical Center in Amsterdam in the Nieder Netherlands. So again, you know, an international perspective. Uh, Mireille is a researcher. She publishes a lot and I envy her because she has, I can say, thousands of papers. No, not thousand, but at least it was two to more than two hundred peer-reviewed papers, and and she's very experienced researcher. So one of the study which she uh, implemented was uh, about the vitamin D and lifestyle intervention for gestational diabetes mellitus, DDM prevention. It was the DALI study, and um, I invited Mirel to share her experiences from that project. So Mirel, the floor is yours now. Thank you, Anna, for this very kind introduction. I hope everybody can hear me all right, um, because I saw in the chat that some people had uh, problems with Yes, yes, I can hear audio. you. I can hear you well. So, Mirel, I, 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 I understand that some people can experience problems, but it's not our fault because they are from different parts of the you know, world. So maybe uh, there are some technical issues, but I can hear you perfectly. So you can continue. I hope very that good. other people <laughs> as well. Yes. Good, so let's get started. As Anna said already, oh, I want to go in the other direction. Not this direction, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, you want to, you know, <laughs> steal something from Lena. Ah, no, no, I'm having the right button. <laughs> okay. So we, we're switching gear um, now a little bit. So we're not talking about a general group of pregnant women anymore. We're talking um, in the DALI study about obese 
pregnant women only. And the reason was um, because it was about, as Anna said, the prevention of gestational diabetes. So that's the diabetes, the type of diabetes that has that is diagnosed only in pregnancy or the first time in the pregnancy. And as you may know, um, same as for type 2 diabetes, being obese is an important risk factor for developing gestational diabetes as well. So we wanted to prevent gestational diabetes, so we focused on, on the, the group that had the highest risk, uh, and that is the women who were obese already before they got pregnant. Um, the DALI study was a European study. Um, I think we, we talk about um, cultural differences as well uh, later on in this seminar. Here we're talking about nine different European uh, countries with slight cultural differences as well. Um, but nevertheless, we managed to do a successful study. So that, that's switching gears a bit uh, from Lena to my presentation. And we are also switching gears a little bit because we're not talking about group sessions anymore, uh, but we're talking about a intervention that's individualized and based on a counseling um, conversation uh, with lifestyle coaches. Oh, different direction again. So the goals of, uh, as I mentioned already, of the DALI lifestyle uh, study was to develop and also evaluate uh, the best intervention for the prevention of gestational diabetes. And we had three different lifestyle interventions that we tested. So that's one intervention that was only uh, focused on healthy eating. And if we talk about healthy eating, that's more like general recommendations uh, like eating more fruits and vegetables, uh, reducing fat intake, um, reducing portion size. So those very simple general messages. Um, one intervention focused on physical activity. Um, so that's really physical activity, so not exercise, uh, activities in daily life, um, walking, uh, working in the garden, uh, walking, but also, of course, exercise and sports activities. And in um, addition, reducing sedentary time. So that was also a, a, a factor that we focused on. And the third intervention was the combination of these two lifestyles. And those interventions were compared to usual care. Before we started with the DALI intervention and in the whole um, preparation phase, uh, we did some, some preparatory work in um, interviewing our target group. And actually, that was also based on my previous experience in such a study on the prevention of gestational diabetes, where, as, as Lena talked about, we um, provided exercise sessions in groups uh, guided by physiotherapists in the Netherlands, uh, where we had a very, very low compliance. So that's why in the DALI study, we decided, okay, before we start developing our interventions, we're talking with our target group and ask them what they want, what they need. Um, and what they told us is that actually, um, different from what many healthcare providers say, is that many women, they wanted to know about their own risk of developing gestational diabetes. Also, if that meant talking about their body weight. So avoiding the whole topic of having a high weight or being obese in pregnancy is something as a healthcare provider, you should not always do. Many women want to talk about this and want to know that they have an increased risk because of their weight. Um, what they also told us is they want support from healthcare professionals. Um, many women told us we know we need to eat healthy. We know that we need to be physically active, but we want this bit of extra support from someone we see regularly during pregnancy. So they really value this. And they said, the programs needs, need to be tailored to the individual in, times, uh, in terms of content, but also in terms of uh, when on the day, uh, more flexible um, um, sessions, uh, timing, etc. 
And uh, many also told us we don't want to be seen as a patient or a woman with obesity or a woman with a high risk of gestational diabetes. We want to talk about us as a person. So we want to have our whole context uh, being considered and also our personal history. Many women with, especially those with obesity, have a history of poor mental health, of struggling with diets and things like that. Um, so they want to be able to talk about that and they want to be that uh, that it's acknowledged as well by the healthcare professionals. So we talk, uh, took all these um, informations um, into account in developing our intervention and um, keep pressing the wrong button, sorry. And this is what we developed. So this is the structure for all three lifestyle interventions. Uh, the, regardless of the content. So we had counseling sessions face to face with the women uh, at several times uh, during the pregnancy with the options of uh, telephone calls in between. And these conversations were based on motivational interviewing. So that's really a technique of talking to someone where the person is in the lead. They are the ones identifying their problems, identifying their own barriers, but also the person um, looking for the, the best solution for them. Uh, of course, with help of our lifestyle coaches. So it was very much about increasing motivation uh, for changing the lifestyle and then making specific plans uh, for getting that into practice. And I'm talking very shortly today only about what we found in the in the lifestyle study. So with these uh, with this intervention, we saw that it was actually the combination of healthy eating and physical activity that had positive um, effects. It had po positive effects both on the physical activity uh, behavior of the women and the dietary behavior. They also managed to reduce their sedentary time, which I think is, is a unique feature in the DALI study. And these um, changes in the lifestyle behavior also um, led to a reduced gestational weight gain compared to the control group. So these women in this intervention group gained two kilos less during pregnancy compared to the control group, which is a substantial uh, reduction is in gestational weight gain. Unfortunately, we didn't find any positive effects on their metabolism, so also not on their risk for gestational diabetes. But very importantly as well, because when we're talking about pregnancy, we're talking about two generations, we also saw a reduction in this intervention group in the fat mass of the, the babies of these women who received counseling on healthy eating and physical activity. And um, being fat when you're born is also a risk factor of um, developing obesity in childhood already. So we think that this is a very positive effect that we can also reduce um, neonatal adiposity in this, with this intervention. And when we looked at the costs, this intervention was also cost effective. So actually, um, if we really want to prevent gestational diabetes, we probably have to start earlier in pregnancy. But for improving lifestyle and also physical activity, I think this intervention um, is very suitable for obese women. And actually, we didn't see any differences between the different European countries where we did the intervention. So throughout let's say Europe, um, this would be a suitable and accepted um, intervention. Um, and I think that also, if you're not a healthcare professional, um, talking, uh, uh, guiding these women through pregnancy, but if you have a role like a fitness instructor or exercise trainer, or perhaps physiotherapist, parts of this intervention, so the motivational interviewing aspect, but so also some content um, can be used um, in addition to the exercises that you do together with the women to motivate them also to become active and reduce their sedentary time um, when they're not in the fitness room with you. Um, so in the, in the rest of their lives. Um, and also, of course, address the issue of healthy eating. Um, so I think it is, it's 
can be more, much more widely implemented than the context where we used it uh, with the lifestyle coaches that were very closely linked with the healthcare professionals. Um, so that's what I wanted to talk to you as a, as a sort of a teaser about the DALI study. And if um, you would do the whole training, I will tell you, of course. Yes, yes. thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mirel. I didn't interrupt you because we are a little bit short of time. So mm -hmm. I was waiting before you... <laughs> finish but uh, I think that the last slide that you have here is um, very crucial for the mistakes that we do uh, very often so we usually start our invitation to have clients uh, during pregnancy when they are at their second trimester so it is mm -hmm. from the past that you know the, the rate of miscarriages is uh, higher when they are active uh, during the first trimester so i think it's a very important message to take home that we should start earlier in pregnancy any interventions and for all these exercise professionals uh, i think that it was a great example of uh, of that how they should work that I think that the um, structure of your research was uh, was beautiful, that you started from the questions, what the women need, how they would like to have the intervention, what they expect from, uh, you know, <laughs> the, the additional support from exercise mm -hmm. professionals. So exercise professionals, if you are with us now, remember about that, uh, asking questions at the beginning, and then also try to find proper solutions so not everything fit everyone we need some more individualized strategies and it can be much more effective so this is my my impression from that so thank you very much Mirel. i know okay. that you will have much more information on the outcomes of the study during the march training so everyone who's interested we invite you to the full lecture and especially the lecture uh, the, the part of the lecture when we have uh, the information on the uh, babies <laughs> which is important for the mothers why they exercise so maybe maybe it is something that they can that it convince them to be active during pregnancy so the healthier babies later on so thank you very much Mirel for that and uh, now we will have Professor Sarah Moss we call uh, her Hanley and so hello Hanley uh, you will present us a little bit about the uh, South African perspective. So what we know, of course, a long list about uh, Hanley, but I just chose a few information that uh, she has been the director of the research focus area, physical activity, sport and recreation at the Potterstrom campus of the Northwest University. And... Um, of course, she's also, as the previous experts, the author of many, many scientific papers in the field of exercise during pregnancy and postpartum. But also, uh, she was awarded the eminent scientist of the year for the African region in 2011. And she was also recognized by the South African Academy of Arts and Culture as the recipient of the Albert Strating Award for Preventive uh, preventative medicine and what as far as i know it was not only related to the period of pregnancy but also you work with people with some disabilities and also uh, other special populations so this is a little bit broader perspective uh, but of course we are concentrated on uh, our topic exercise during pregnancy and um, it will be interesting for us how this area, how this topic is developing in your country. So, Hanley, the floor is yours. Please start your presentation. Um, thank you, um, Anna. If you can please just guide me. I'm not seeing my presentation anymore. So oh, I'll, but I, I can see. I can see. So <laughs> I will move on, but I will speak as I go. Right. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present today just a snapshot of South Africa and how pregnancy and physical activity is playing out in this country. At the, um, web, at the course, I will spend more time. So as most of you know, or might not know, South Africa is a very diverse country. Um, we have 11 national cultures, 11 lang official languages, 
of which Afrikaans, English are mostly spoken with um, Zulu and Isikosa. But with this diversity also, we are one of the countries with the biggest divide between the rich and the poor. Um, and together with that, we also have a very challenging security environment in our country. So what does this have to do with pregnancy? Well, you will see as I go along how these nuances play in into uh, allowing people to be physically active. Um, together with this uh, big difference in rich, poor, and we also have a secondary problem, and that is a very high percentage of teenage pregnancy. And this was even more increased during the COVID period. So 30% of the teenage girls fall pregnant. And as you know, um, regarding physical activity, teenage girls tend to be less physical active anyway. And now they're also pregnant. So this is sort of a double burden that is, that is coming into the health aspects. If we look at South Africans in general, we are not known as a country to be very physically active. We are one of the least active countries. Together with that, we also have the highest prevalence of obesity. Although we are in a country where we have a big coastline, people enjoy the sea, they have the Comrades Marathon, which is an ultra marathon. We have a good climate. We're not challenged like Lena in Norway. Um, but we do not find our community being physically active. And you know all the benefits of being regularly physically active, but yet we need to understand why we are not being physically active as a nation. And this can also be due to the double burden of disease. We, we also faced with HIV and TB, which is very prevalent in our country. So besides that, um, if we look at the maternal health care model in South Africa, it's based on the WHO model. And 80% of our population is dependent on the public health care. And they are scheduled to visit regularly at um, public health care facilities and clinics and a compulsory ultrasound at the age of 24 weeks. And this is the way the government has implemented these WHO guidelines to reduce the maternal death rate that um, is so, it used to be a high. It's decreased significantly, but it's not as low as in developed countries yet. So looking into physical activity in pregnancy in South Africa, um, we haven't had so many large studies and I tried to summarize some of these studies and give you a snapshot and I will expand on this in the um, course coming up. But we find um, not very good designs um, all the time, um, very few longitudinal studies, more cross-sectional, which means it's a snapshot comparing the first trimester to the second to the third um, at different levels. Most of these questionnaires being used to obtain the physical activity um, information. And you also always know that the subjective manner can be either over representation or under representation of the true um, physical activity levels. Um, but in these slides, you can see that the, the physical activity do decrease across the time. Um, let me just go to the next one. Um, this is a more recent study where they've also done a cross-sectional study, but the levels stay low. Um, in the Potchestroom area a few years ago, we had a longitudinal study, the HAPI study, and we can see that the levels of moderate physical activity, which is the grey um, bar, for the first trimester, it was 105 minutes. The second trimester, 78, and the third trimester, 53 minutes. So this is the same as what um, they see in Europe. There's a decrease during pregnancy, uh, but yet the levels are very low. And we found in our data that even three months post, the uh, physical activity levels were lower than that was um, in the pre-pregnancy 
period. So this is quite concerning and we will elaborate on this. If we look at the, um, the reasons or the perceptions during pregnancy, and this is a student from Professor Morel van Poppel, um, Estelle Watson, that did quite a, a few nice studies on why the women are not pregnant. And I will speak more to the findings they um, um, published. But the barriers were tiredness, morning sickness, interrupted sleep, lack of time and money, um, lack of knowledge and information, and then cultural beliefs, which are quite um, different. Um, this, this is from the women, and there's been a, a more recent study where they looked at the cultural beliefs. And those of you from South Africa will know we have, we have a part of the population that only used Western medicine, and then we have up to a, where traditional healers are being followed. And in this recent study about perceptions, it's about the biggest influence is from the um, the family members, the mother, the mother-in-law, the sister, or other pregnant women, and the areas where they get their knowledge is from the uh, religious congregations, and the type of information is that the the traditional medicines will help with labour, help with um, early onset of nausea and things like that. So we will go into more detail. But the challenge is that these traditional medicines, the, the compounds aren't always known. And when the, the person or the pregnant woman lands up at the health care provider, they don't know what has been taken or ingested. And, th and that can be quite um, dangerous um, as well. Um, Estelle also looked at the um, perceptions from the medical practitioners um, and that was also interesting that um, they, they are aware of the guidelines but they don't always um, refer people. 39% will refer a pregnant woman to an exercise professional um, and they did not know that a pregnant woman could do strength training. So there's a big lack um, or education to our health professionals as well to provide the information for these pregnant women because most of them are scared. If they lack the knowledge, they will rather avoid being physically active than starting an exercise program. But then on the other side, we have um, healthcare professionals which are experts um, in physical activity prescription for pregnant women, such as our biokineticists and our physiotherapists. Um, and they have classes going. There's a group in South Africa called Fit for Two. Um, and this is in the um, richer, higher income areas where you will find the fitness um, studios. Um, and then, of course, we have the nurses that get trained when they do mid midwifery. Um, but basic information and motivation. But um, Lena mentioned the availability of gyms, which is something in South Africa which is a costly affair as well. So wh what should we do? Where should we go forward with physical activity in South Africa to promote it? Um, in summary, I think we need more knowledge to be disseminated to the general population. We need more education to our healthcare professionals and Ubuntu and doing things in groups is very important in the cultural context of South Africa. So group sessions would be a way to, to support. And Morel, um, as project, I think is a very nice approach to, to be inclusive in your, your design of your physical um, activity programs, but to also make it cultural specific so that you can also understand the cultural perceptions and change that around to be more physically active. And of course, dietary intake is a very important aspect because to prevent this um, exclusive weight gain, you also need to address the dietary intake. So I think in future for the South African context, it would be to not only edu educate, but also to demonstrate if there are examples of pregnant women showing other pregnant women um, it, you know, what you can do and that it's safe, I think it will be easier to, to bring more people to become um, physically active. 
And then finally, I think, yes, specialized um, professionals, because South Africa is a very high prevalence of hypertension and diabetes. So preeclamps and gestational diabetes is a real risk within the South African context. And um, thank you, Anna. Okay, thank you very much, Hanley. Yes, everything uh, what we needed <laughs> again. So nice issue uh, about the education of health professional. I observed what's going on uh, in the chat. So some people mentioned that no doctor um, will post the, the, the patient to physical activity programs. So maybe not you know not so bad I, I don't believe that no doctor it's not the proper <laughs> proper uh, picture but i think that still too little um health professionals recommend physical activity for their patients and what we could see on your slide hanley it was is something that that uh, it is the reason why so even if they know the guidelines they maybe are not so convinced how to do that and again this is the place for exercise professionals we need exercise mm -hmm. professionals who are credible for health professionals and everyone can trust uh everyone so we have nice cooperation and we have nice team to support to support pregnant and postpartum women to be physically active so thank you very much for that point and also about the culture so as you mentioned the family uh, the beliefs sometimes it is even stronger than the evidence-based resources mm -hmm. of information right so sometimes we have to respect the cultural aspects we have to respect the beliefs because uh we will not fight with them so quickly so we must find solution how to be around them and how to to increase the physical activity during pregnancy all right so thank you very much Hanley. now we will have uh, <laughs> now we will have a um, uh, professor from iran uh, assistant professor naimeh al sadat shoyayen from islamic azad university uh, so hello naimeh I know that you are with us. So for those people who are struggling with the voice, we can expect some, maybe not the best quality from um, NIMEC uh, because of the situation in her country. So the internet not always is the best one, but we are trying to. So I hope that, that it will be good enough that you can listen to this nice presentation because it will be the um, cultural context of the situation for Iranian uh, women. And just a short introduction, um, uh, Naimech is, uh, is a professor working on different aspects of maternal exercise uh, and the influence of maternal exercise on the development of infants. So very, very interesting. Also, she was involved in a project um, uh, in which she analyzed the effects of high intensity interval training on the estradiol serum concentration and sexual satisfaction among postpartum women. And she also analyzed the relationships between maternal prenatal physical activity and COVID-19 symptoms among pregnant women. So some, some, some may be connected, related, but not the same issues. And uh, which is important, NIMEX said that she has a goal to inform people, to inform students, to inform researchers how important physical activity is for their lifestyle, for their health, and especially for the development of the children. So NIMEX, the floor is yours. Please present what you prepared. Thank you, dear Anna. Thank you. Hello, everyone from Iran, and good afternoon. Now we want to talk about barriers and facilitators of physical activity in pregnancy and postpartum in Iran. Maybe some of you don't have any information about Iran. At first, I want to talk about Iran, also called Persia, is a country located in Western Asia. It covers an area of 1.7 million square kilometers, making it the 70th largest country. Iran has an estimated population of 86 million and make it the 70th most populous country in the world. 
and the uh, second largest in the Middle East. One of the big and major issue in my country, as same as the others, is sedentary behavior. Sedentary lifestyles are spreading worldwide and many factors causes to this situation. Sedentary behavior refers to the certain activities in uh, uh, reclining, seated, or uh, lying position requires very low energy expenditure. Uh, it's a predictor, uh, predictor of metabolic diseases, diseases and refers to the people who don't meet current physical activity guidelines. What is the result? Uh, the statistical uh, reports show that 20% uh, of adults worldwide are sedentary and inactivity is more common in women. Around 3.2 million deaths each year are uh, refers to the insufficient physical activity. And it's the fourth risk factor for the deaths in the world. Uh, it's the main cause for some diseases such as the cancer, diabetes, and uh, chronic diseases. Uh, in Iran, uh, around 40% of the population are considered without physical activity, and it's very common among women. Okay, now I make sure, uh, sorry for the interruption, I will uh, switch off the camera, so maybe the voice uh, will be better. Maybe uh, uh, when you turn off the camera, so let's try like that, because the voice is we can hear you but not i do perfect. want to turn off my camera yes yes yeah, please Anna. try to do that yes okay Okay, Naimeh. Hello, hello, Naimeh, are you with us? Hello, hello. Not very well, not very well. Other participants, not very well, not very well. Can I hear the room and comment? No, unfortunately not. Uh, sorry for that. Sorry, some technical issues. Some technical issues. So, Naimech, maybe I will go ahead because um, I will continue for you because we cannot hear you, unfortunately. All right. Excuse me, but we can't hear anything, so I, I cannot hear you as well. So, Naimek, so uh, I will I will present the situation in Iran for you. So, uh, in Iran, seventy percent of pregnant women did not have any physical activity, and ninety eight percent had poor physical activities. But during the first trimester, what I mentioned before, we have fifty two. So. It is um, at the beginning a little bit better than um, it was supposed to be uh, because uh, in Europe, usually women are not active, particularly during the first few weeks. Um, so what was mentioned by, by other presenters, uh, we have 
to be active during pregnancy to prevent gestational diabetes, hypertension, depression, and to improve the quality of life, motor and social skills of the children. And I know this is the, the, the data that um, Professor Naime Shayoyen analyzes. So the, the, the quality of life and motor and social skills. It's, it's a very interesting study. So I hope that during the training in March, you will have the chance to listen to the, to the full uh, lecture. And uh, it is a nice question that professor asked, why do they decrease their physical activity levels in this period? So we know the benefits, okay, we know that it is beneficial. So why we decrease the levels? So why not, not we, but the pregnant women? And it is nice. Um, uh, yeah, professor, can you hear me? Yes, but not. I, I started to present. I started to present. All right, because we have to 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 continue NIMEX. So it's very very poor sound of you. So I'm presenting your slides. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'm sorry for this. No, it's not. I understand. We discussed it before, and I was ready for that because we mentioned that the situation in Iran is very difficult for having the yeah. internet access, and and I I really understand that. But we wanted to try at least. So the slides are prepared as you can see that we have some barrier we have facilitators and we have structural factors and uh i will First not can I, can I continue this uh, the slide yes, yes. Yeah. please no. go ahead thank you thank you uh, thank you for um, uh, continuing this uh, slides uh, after reading some studies in iran uh, I choose the pen culture model, a satirical framework to concentrate on culture and health promotion behavior and compare the relevant factors in the development of educational intervention. Uh, this uh, approach uh, shows some uh, barriers and uh, structural factors and facilitators. Some barriers uh, refers in the, uh, show uh, shows in this uh, slide. Uh, you can see. Uh, Social cultural factors, social economic factors, and individual factors. Social cultural factors refer to some uh, sub factors uh, like uh, social inter uh, interaction, religion, and the role of family members, and especially husband. Uh, in Iran, uh, usually uh, the family members uh, are banned the women from the PA because of their talks, their beliefs, and attitudes. Uh, social economic factors refers to some uh, financial problems, lack of access to health care centers, and individual factor refers to motivation, morphological changes, and fatigues. Uh, social factors refers to environmental factors and organizational factors. And uh, included with some equipment and possibility in health centers, such as lack of sport space or places, or lack of professional staff, and lack of sufficient measure. And finally, facilitator uh, refers to natural factors and uh, support from others. Uh, it, uh, refers to some the role of husband uh, to motivate to do physical activity during pregnancy and of course after delivery purpose of parents support the women role of a physician to advise to physical activity uh, and availability to uh, of guide uh, guidance or uh, education social network and something like that uh, to some uh, facilities and barriers are the essential determinant factor for PA, therefore more studies, projects, webinars, uh, conduct and training women to increase the motivation and knowledge to do physical activity during the life. Uh, and you can see uh, some more reference uh, about some studies in Iran uh, about the facilitator and barriers among uh, pregnant women and postpartum. Uh, I, I know that our factors should be discussed in the future. I hope to see you in the next edition on March. And uh, thank you for attention and patience. And I'm sorry for uh, our issues that occur in this uh, presentation. And have a great time.
Okay. Okay. So thank you very much, Naime. You managed just to go through this most important part. I like, uh, uh, you know, that you said that you said about the husband issues. So um, thank you, participants, for being with us. Uh, and I know that that maybe it was difficult to understand, but I will repeat. So the one of the barrier in I Iran is that the uh, family is very strong influencer influence of uh, physical activity and uh it is not so easy like for european uh, women and it was something that um, uh changed my thinking uh, for the promotion of physical activity when i when I listened to the uh, lecture by Professor Naimek for the first time, because I started to think that we really need different strategies to promote physical activity during pregnancy uh, in the culture uh, like, like that, that the husband has the role to tell the woman if she is allowed to go. Sometimes, I know that not in all families, but generally uh, it is a little bit different. So when we want to increase the level of uh, physical activity we have to educate the male uh, part of the family not on the women because usually we are more focused on the women but also the husbands the brothers the fathers the uncles so this is our target nowadays to find the proper educational sources and i'm so happy that for the march edition so many male exercise professionals uh registered because it is important that male um not only exercise professionals but generally that 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 future husband future partners future fathers are involved in this process so thank you for that all right and now uh i will go to the last expert um, for today professor xian guo from beijing sport university in china uh, we call her tina so this is the english uh, name for for professor xian guo uh, of course short introduction as for other experts um, and as uh, other people here other panelists she is researcher and also she has some practical background so uh, she implement implements some projects related to the prevention of gestational diabetes mellitus and also uh, in prevention of urinary incontinence. And it was a very nice study that I had a chance to read it. Uh, it was about the 12-week Roomba dance intervention um, in elderly, and I guess it is also performed in postpartum women. And which is interesting for you is that Tina uh, developed and also posted nice online, free online training in terms of pelvic floor muscle training. And in uh, 2021, the videos have been viewed and learned by more than 36,000 of uh, participants in China and it was in 2021 so I guess now it is much much more so Tina please go ahead with your presentation thank you Anna thank you for your introduction hello everyone uh, today I want to introduce the physical activity during pregnancy and after childbirth in China okay According to a very recently research uh, from 15,698 women in 15 provinces of China, the physical activity level of pregnant women were generally low. And we can see the figure of the right, we can see that from the first trimester to the second or the third trimester, there are more than 40 percent of women still in low level of physical activity during pregnancy uh, in during each trimester only uh, 10 more uh, no, no more than 20 percent of women in high level of physical activity during their pregnancy and pregnant women will get the advice about nutrition during their hospital visits, but few will give them professional exercise advice during their pregnancy. The pregnant women, they didn't know how to do exercise, what type of exercise they can do, and what 
uh, the intensity and the endurance or the time, what they can do. And the most popular exercise is walking in China during their pregnancy. Uh, right now, more and more Chinese women are taking part in yoga and gymnastics, but still lots of them worried about the abortion during exercise. So they're still in low physical activity, more than uh, we can see from before, more than 40% of pregnant women still in low physical activity in China. Uh, the current situation during pre pregnancy is not very ideal, but how about the postpartum? Uh, first, I want to introduce a traditional uh, culture, uh, this postpartum period in China. It's name called Zuo Yue in Chinese, and we can call it doing the months in English or postpartum confinement. Uh, doing the months is a very traditional practice for postpartum care and uh, which mothers stay at home for a month. Uh, not only for a month, we can see from this picture, uh, it's about 42 days uh, immediately after their childbirth. And it is a form of social support for the mothers in Chinese society. Uh, for over 2,000 years, many generations of Chinese women have practiced this traditional ritual. And uh, this a traditional custom of doing the months stipulates that women should be confined to their own home for 42 days after giving birth to their baby. And during this postpartum months, and the new mommies follow specific regulations to control their physical activity and to control their diet, even their emotions. And we think that childbirth is associated with dramatic transformation in female energy and body. And there are lots of regulations during, during the months in China. Uh, first, I want to introduce the activity and the warmth uh, during doing the months. Uh, physical activity is limited to resting in bed most of the day during doing the months. And the women avoid domestic duties, including watching televisions and reading books because we think such activities are believed to be associated with disease in later life, such as chronic back pain and head pain or poor eyesight. And besides, we may avoid exposure to the cold and confined to the house for one month and avoid drafts. And uh, some daily personal care such as bathing, bathing and washing feet and their hair and brushing their teeth is also restricted to prevent the new mommy's body from being exposed to the cold wind we always do uh, like the right picture. You can see that we wear hands during our doing the months, even in summer. Uh, the temperatures in some Chinese uh, countries, uh, uh, cities are very high in the summer. We need to wear hats during the summer. And we need to wear this warm sleep suits during our doing the months to keep our body warm, to uh, being exposed, we are not allowed to exposed to the cold wind. And how about uh, the, the, the physical activity? According to a research in 435 Chinese women during during the months, uh, the investigation found that 64.6 .6 women never do physical activity in this 42 days and only 3.8% women do physical activity every day. And only 1.3% women do physical activity more than three times in their during the month period. How about the uh, dietary intake? What do we eat during our during the month period? And uh, in our traditional practice, we think that to increase our recovery and to make more milk for the baby, we need to 
eat more than five meals a day, and always we drink a lot of soup.、Uh, that's our traditional soup、uh, during during the months. We can see from this picture,、uh, the left, the top of the left, the the up of the left. That's the chicken soup.、Uh, the down of the left, we can see that's the fish and the tofu soup. And the right side, we can see. Uh, this is very traditional food and the soup in China. That's pig's food, pig's food soup, and this one、uh, is the rib soup.、Uh, we need to drink soup every day and every meal.、Uh, we think that's、uh, better for our nutritional, and we will.、Uh, it will increase our dietary intake and make us. More beneficial from the recovery from this food,、uh, and I think there are lots of social factors、uh, in this traditional culture in China:、uh, the education and the income, or region of residence and postpartum home visits by a health worker or attendance at health education courses influence this traditional. Adherence, and、uh, in China, rural women tend to adhere to doing the month practices more frequently than urban and suburban women in China. How about the outcomes?、Uh, there are lots of research investigate the outcomes from doing the month. We can see that while Chinese postpartum women spend a large amount of daily time in bed. As I mentioned before, they think that、uh, lie down all the bed,、uh, resting all the time in bed will uh, leave us uh, from the risk of chronic back pain and head pain. But the restriction of physical activity from this research, we found that it will cause. Muscular skeletal and cardiovascular deconditioning, from which women slowly recovery. And another study from rural China reported that the traditional practices did not decrease the risk of chronic pain for women five to eleven years after childbirth. And another research finds that activity restriction also results in decreased time for mother and infant interaction. Assuming mothering and learning infant care, there in affecting maternal competence and self-esteem, which increases the risk of postpartum depression.、Uh, but some studies have.、Uh, Some opposite results. They suggest that the traditional postpartum practice provide legitimate family support and protective actions for new mothers, and it will relieve physical pain and reducing the severity of symptoms, overcoming stress, and preventing poor mental health and depression after delivery. Okay, how about the physical activity after childbirth in China? According to Liu's data, ingestional diabetes mellitus women after childbirth in six months, there were twenty one point five percent still lived in sedentary life.、Uh, the situation is better. Seventy、uh, percent have moderate physical activity. Uh, after childbirth, but only 8.5 percent had vigorous physical activity after their childbirth. And another research investigated physical activity from the end of during the month to one year after childbirth. We can see from this figure that more than five fifty percent of new mothers never did exercise in this period. And only twenty-seven point two percent women after childbirth did exercise every day. I think there are a lot of efforts needed to do in China to bridge the gap 
between traditional practices and the current evidence about physical activity during women's pregnancy and postpartum upon maternal health. Okay, thank you for listening. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Tina. Yes, it was a short, uh, a short um, overview what you have in China, and I must admit that uh, it was the uh, lecture by Tina that inspired me for having uh, for having uh, this uh, webinar, the context, the cultural context, because as you can imagine that there are some women uh, in China who spend forty two days in bed, they cannot. Uh, walk they cannot wash the hair so what about the guidelines so we would like to encourage them to be physically active we have nice written nicely written documents but it's it's nothing for for them because you know culture is the culture tradition is the tradition and uh, we have to change the mind of a few generation i think that it will be implemented so it's not enough to have good data it's not enough to have good documents we need to educate again and change. All right. So uh, I can see, uh, I can see that some people have to leave because we are over time. But uh, if there are some people who can stay with me for ten more minutes, please stay because I will shortly present you our project. So it, the webinar it was just a small sample of that what we have. Usually we have the full lectures. Uh, of each expert so you can have more chance to ask questions and and to be in the interaction but what we do uh we try to organize it this is my university Gdańsk university of physical education and sport in poland this is the um, coordinator of the project as i mentioned we have all the classes entirely online these classes are run using the um teams application uh, and also the practical part is done online. So these are the uh, examples of practical classes with Professor Kari Bull, pelvic floor muscle training, and also with Simona Payawiene. Uh, it was Nirvana class, the breathing exercises. So people really like this, like these classes a, lo a lot. And the final practical assessments are also done entirely online. So you send us the videos and we can assess you how you can interact with the client how you can explain the exercises so everything is done entirely online and what else uh, we have uh, also the uh, examples of classes done outdoor so you can choose uh, if you would like to work with a pregnant client or postpartum client so this is an example from ayana she had a wonderful class with the um you know a new mom and we use some uh outcomes of the online provision of fitness services lifelong learning qualification it is nice document developed for this purposes so we try to keep high quality of of the online training and our aim is to develop nice program for you so we use all these recommendations that we can have from all over the world we try to have new trends so this is my topic i love high intensity interval training some people ask oh women pregnant women can exercise with high intensity uh so uh yes we have some some responses for that and uh, as I mentioned, we have a team of core team. We call that uh, team core team because uh, we meet these experts a lot uh, during the training. But we also invite new exper experts for some additions from different countries to make this training more uh, interesting for you. We use uh, some materials which were developed also in the international cooperation. So one of this is the Springer book uh, edited by Professor Rita Santos Rocha. There's a nice, uh, I can see maybe not manual, but this is an essential uh, content what we use during the classes. And again, uh, we have nice materials also developed by the experts who uh, conduct the classes. We have YouTube channel, uh, again, run by Professor Rita Santos Rocha or the YouTube channel run by Professor Margie Davenport. Or we also recommend this one for Chinese students, not for all because it is in Chinese. So uh, this uh, uh, run by Tina. All people who 
will be assessed and we will verify their learning outcomes, uh, they will get exercise in pregnancy and postpartum certificate. And what we do, we try to be in accordance with the Europe Active Exercise in Pregnancy and Postpartum Lifelong Learning Standards. So you can scan the document and you can watch what is inside. And if you would like to apply, remember the dates. Uh, the training will run from the 3rd to 31st of March. It will be conducted entirely online in English. The classes will be uh, from 2 to 7 p.m. C Central European time and during weekends from 10 to 6. It is around 150 teaching hours. And what is interesting for you, all the classes will be recorded. So we are aware that it is a very intensive course. We meet every day, almost every day, because there are some classes which are self-preparation, self-practice hours. Uh, but these classes who are conducted by our experts are recorded so you can watch them later on selection criteria the priority have the students because the project is financed by uh, our national agency for academic exchange but we would like to invite all exercise professionals because we consider that it is really important training for you and uh, you are also welcomed if we have um, places so far it was not a problem now i must admit that we already have 95 people registered and they are awaiting for the uh, interview so uh i don't know how many people we can <laughs> we can take uh, and the applications for the training by the end of january uh, and uh, we will start um, uh, like that. So first we assess your documents that you submit to us. Then uh, we will see you uh, during an online interview. So it will be between January 16 and February 15. It is not a long interview. It's like 10, 15 minutes. Uh, and also uh, it is a nice conversation that we try to assess your communication skills and your motivation why you would like to become an exercise professionals ready for the uh, exercise in pregnancy uh, topic if you would like to have more information about the recruitment procedure please scan uh, this uh, QR code you have here recruitment regulations full document and also the application form and also the assessment for form for conducting pro-health exercise session for these people who are not exercise professionals, who are not the students of any field of sport related to sport. And you would like to prove that you are ready for this training. So we would like to see how you conduct classes, not with pregnant clients, but generally with any adults, because we will not have time to teach you everything. We will not have time to teach you anatomy, physiology and biomechanics and everything. So therefore, we need some kind of proof. And these are the criteria that you have to fulfill. You have this on our web page. We would like to have as many participants from as many countries as possible. Uh, so far, we have uh, representatives from 17 countries. Uh, so uh, we have also nice feedback from them. So thank you very much uh, that, that you like the training, that you find it useful. We have nice promotional video material if you would like to, 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 to see what we have. This is also another another uh, QR code for you to have the YouTube uh, promotional video. So now me, we don't have much time because uh, already we are over time. I can see that so many people already had to leave because as I mentioned, we are over time. There were some questions about the presentations and about the recording. Yes, uh, the, the presentation will not be available for you, but we will prepare a video uh, from this webinar. So maybe we will cut the technical issues not to uh, get you bored with that. Uh, so please give us uh, a few days and it will be posted on our university YouTube channel. Um, and I think that you can go through it again. And it is available today for 24 hours on the web, uh, on the Facebook uh, of the uh, organizer. OK. Uh, all right. So um, 
Uh, I can see I can see that there. Thank you, thank you. I'm so grateful for the coordinator of the presentation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So some people are leaving. So maybe you have some questions to 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 our uh, panelists. Uh, I could see some comments uh, between in, during between, but now uh, I am not able to find it. So how much it costs uh, the core? It is for free. So, uh, yes, it is amazing, I know. So we have the best experts from over the world and this training is for free. The only cost that you may face later on is the registration in the European Register of Exercise Professionals because we have limited funds for that. So only the students uh, will be financed, but it is just around 30 euro for the registration. So that's it. Uh, okay, so any questions? any questions so i would go to our expert just to say bye so if you are with us uh, i can see tina is with me i can see uh that other experts uh, are appearing <laughs> i won't be able to take part in the nepa course will there be more occasions for that no unfortunately i cannot say because uh, the march edition is the last one and uh, I'm not sure if we will get more funds for, for future products. I would like to. I would like to because uh, it's, it's really interesting and I can see much more interests from each edition and we can develop and we can improve. And I really think we should share the knowledge what the experts have because sometimes they don't have time to prepare the educational programs and to implement it. But it is really something worth to spread and and we should do uh, this uh oh so philip 30, 40 euros from ereps members from april 1st okay just go and email about the uh, all right <laughs> so 40 euros but i still think it is something worth to spend on this course but it's not uh, compulsory to pay for the registration if you would like to attend the course and just have the certificate that's enough to to, to be part of that um all right so Hmm. let me go through maybe some question because i've seen some comments maybe not questions uh, so i'm happy that you like the webinar sorry for the technical issue very interesting uh there is a comment uh, i am a personal trainer specialized in pelvic floor dysfunction uh, and posture it's 10 years that is i have been working with low pressure fitness hypopressive and the training system is the only one with unavailable i cannot unavailable results for post -pass, for for post -pass, for postpartum recovery like diastasis recti and incontinence and the only one that reduce waistline in a short time now a certified fitness and health professionals all right so um uh, i would i would <laughs> i would uh, uh, say that there are many programs, interesting programs for pelvic muscles and for diastasis recti treatment. And for now, for knowledge that we have, we don't have the best solution. And I think that the 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 best practice is to check what is beneficial for each client. And we should be uh, careful to say that there is the only one, the best one uh, in the market. But we invite you to, to, to attend and see what offer our experts have. How do I know if my registration has reached you by email for the practice in March? You must apply by Google Forms that is uh, on our web page. All right. So not by email. You must register by our online registration form. So then we will get your registration and you will get an email uh, about the, the, the time when we would like to meet you. Uh, uh, is there a website we can check and register for NEPA courses? Yes, of course. I showed you. So maybe maybe not to keep the, the, the other people too long. I will come back very quickly to the slide with the, uh, with the QR code. Please scan this one. All right. So this is this, the, the QR code that we have for all necessary documents. So this is the recruitment regulations this is the application form and also some other information that will be useful for you okay all right let's come back uh, okay so sorry i didn't hear the answer for the test my contacts 
all right so some technical issues <laughs> sorry all right so tina hanley lena and mirel i don't want to uh, keep you longer because i know i know you are very busy so thank you once again you were wonderful as always as always so i always look for your classes and even if i don't have time to be with you uh, always so i try to listen to your classes later on and even if i am person who are 20 years uh, in the topic of exercise during pregnancy i always learn a lot from you i always learn a lot from you and i'm sure that the that the uh, participants will learn a lot from you as well so thank you once again and i hope to see you uh soon <laughs> bye 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 have a nice rest of the day <laughs> yes bye 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 bye